welcome to Scene Through Glass. Today is a very exciting day for multiple reasons. You find me at Lotus HQ in Hethel, and I'm super pleased to announce that this summer, I'm gonna be collaborating with Lotus to bring you some really awesome exclusive content, including my first road trip post lockdown. I cannot wait to get back on the road. You may have thought that after Drive the World last year, I'd be pretty happy just kind of hanging around in the UK, but no, the travel bug continues to bite and I need to go on another adventure. However, with the 911 Carrera T recently being sold, my 360s actually at the workshop getting a brake upgrade, more on that another time, kind of felt like the X3 would be a bit boring on a summer road trip. So that is where Lotus have stepped in and saved the day because they are going to give me the keys to their Avora GT 410 Sport for the summer. Now, I've been harking on a lot recently about the fact that I feel like a lot of modern cars are a bit fluffy, lacking emotion, lacking character. And I have to say, I've driven an Avora GT 410 Sport before, and it's the complete opposite of that. Of course, lightweight, driver-focused, manual, with one of the fruitiest exhausts I've ever heard. I know it's gonna be brilliant, but before we go and pick up that car and head down to the Eurotunnel to kickstart the road trip, I'm actually gonna head across the road here at Hethel, because you guys know I'm an F1 and motorsport nut. And a lot of sort of Lotus's history is, is intertwined with F1 history. And classic Team Lotus, who run the kind of heritage Lotus race cars, have moved into a sort of new building since I was last here. And apparently it's amazing. So I'm gonna go over there, nerd out, and then we'll come back to this side of the road to go and pick up this Evora GT 410 Sport. I can't, this is a what a day. I realize not everyone is gonna share my excitement about being in this room. I know Formula One's becoming more popular, especially because of Drive to Survive, but, but in here we're kind of looking at 60s, 70s, and a little bit of 80s F1. So yeah, I'm definitely appealing to a certain audience, but, but this is amazing for me. I am totally freaking out, mainly because last time I visited Classic Team Lotus, they were kind of operating out of a, out of a shed. I mean, that sounds horrible, but it, it was actually kind of cool because it felt like it transported you to an old school era when Formula One teams were ran out of sheds, uh, but they have now moved into this amazing new building. And with all the cars on display like this, it's just kind of jaw dropping. If you don't know about the kind of importance of Lotus within motorsport, then let me try and paint a bit of a picture for you. Lotus, well, in the 60s and 70s, were pretty much the most dominant team in Formula One. So much so that even though they won their last championship in 1978, they are still the fourth, fourth most winging, oh, this is gonna to be tough to say. Essentially, constructors' championships, they're fourth in the league. <laughs> You've only got Ferrari, Williams, and McLaren ahead of them. So think of Mercedes, think of Red Bull. They still haven't won as many constructors' championships as Lotus did back in the day. But over and above that, the kind of whole thing was down to the founder, Colin Chapman, who was a complete visionary. Essentially, a modern day F1 car only exists or only is the way it is because of ideas that Colin had way back in the day. And they're on display with the cars behind me. Some ideas that then eventually got banned because they were kind of too genius or maybe too quick. So yeah, it's absolutely unreal to get up close and personal with this stuff. Uh, mixture of, uh, of customer cars that actually still go racing at classic or historic racing events. And then also some actual Chapman family cars as well that are made up behind me. So let's do a quick walk around. I'm gonna point out some of the cars that really stand out to me uh, and yeah, try not to drool over the lovely glossy paintwork. Now, not everyone gets the chance to come in here, so I have to say a huge thanks to Lotus for giving me this uh, access. I want to start here with maybe what's not the most iconic Lotus ever, but it's a good place to start because look at this picture here of Colin Chapman on the grid, Nigel Mansell on his right, Elio De Angelis on the left. Uh, it gives you an idea of some of the, the glory days, let's say. Uh, speaking of later glory days, though, this car right here is the car that Ayrton Senna won his first ever Grand Prix in, 1985, Portugal, and yes, this crossed the line first. This, this actual very car. Absolutely nuts to see. Uh, iconic with the JPS John Player Special black and gold livery that I think a lot of people associate with the Lotus uh, racing team. Going back a few years then from that center car and this is actually Lotus's first Constructors Championship car. 1963 Jim Clark behind the wheel. His championship year as well. And this is the, the very car that he won the championship in. First semi monocoque car. If I bring you over here I mean the thing is tiny but look at the seat the man must have had 
hips like, well, I was going to say Shakira, but I don't think she had thin hips. I don't really know. Like, just unbelievable to see the size and the dimensions of this car. And obviously, at the time, it was revolutionary, like so many of Colin Chapman's designs. But yeah, beautiful to see in its kind of iconic British racing green. And uh, yeah, very much an early successful Lotus. As I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of people associate the JPS John Player Special livery with Team Lotus, but I actually am more obsessed with this gold leaf livery. This is a Graham Hill car, the actual car that he won the championship in in 1968. But I think more impressively, this car, this actual car, won back-to-back -back Monaco Grand Prix, 1967 and 1968, the only car ever to win two Monaco Grand Prix. But as I say, I love it because of the livery. It was actually the first time that a team had kind of done a livery for a sponsor. Before then, you kind of always run in your, in your country's colours, British racing green. There you go, you can see at the back. But Colin Chapman wasn't only a genius engineer, he was also a crude businessman, uh, and he went, well, why don't we just sell the, the livery of our car to one of our sponsors, and therefore this was born. And, and this reminds me of... F1's real sort of glamour glory days. I don't know why I think maybe Graham Hill, a bit of an icon of that era anyway, but something about this particular car, seeing images, photos of it, him thrashing it around, as I say, Monaco or the Nürburgring, uh, it just really, really appeals to me. So I'm a big fan of this one. If you thought the Graham Hill car was successful, check this out. This is the Type 72, which won three Constructors' Championship. The same car winning three Constructors' Championship and two Drivers' Championships. And in fact, the only posthumously awarded Drivers' Championship, Jochen Rint, uh, sadly lost his life in an accident before the season was over. Uh, but he'd amassed so many points that he was still awarded the title. Um, so yeah, no other car has done what this thing has done. Raced for five years, uh, and as I say, winning all those titles. Absolutely nuts to see. And there's lots of elements here which are still, or basically... Uh, introduced elements that are still on uh, Formula One cars today. So, for example, uh, radiators in the sort of sideboards there, uh, inboard brakes down here, uh, big old slicks. Um, you've got the wing at the back, which is uh, adjustable flaps. Of course, today they're still adjusting uh, wings when they're heading out on circuit. But yeah, it looks recognisable to me as a sort of semi modern day F1 car, um, but unbelievable to see because of what it achieved. So here it is, my car for the summer, an Evora GT 410 Sport. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I have actually driven one of these before, a yellow car, but I only drove it on track. Not just any track though, the Top Gear test track. It was for a challenge against Paul Wallace from Supercars of London where I was trying to beat a lap time. He'd set around the track on a computer game. It was an amazing experience, an amazing day, heightened by the fact that this car really blew me away. I've always been an Evora fan and I kind of knew what to expect because I drove, I think it was an Evora 400 for the F-Type replacement series. So yes, I kind of had an idea of what was going to happen when I got behind the wheel, but I feel like the GT410 Sport just went on another the level and I just remember falling in love with it mainly because of the soundtrack oh my god when you hear the supercharged v6 engine and the exhaust I think you're gonna understand why I'm so excited to take this thing down to yes the south of France of course we're going to Monaco into Italy up through Switzerland and really anywhere else that I fancy because I have the keys to this car I'm so overexcited if you don't really know anything about I don't know the Lotus range of cars or, or where the Evora sits in the current lineup you do also also have Exige and Elise, but they're slightly more sort of track focused, purposeful in the way they go about driving on the road. This thing, theoretically, easier to live with. You can even get it as a two plus two. It's a sort of back bench, not really back seats, but you could put a small child back there, I suppose. And theoretically, I'm going to be able to take this thing all the way through France. Then when I get down to the south of France, find a twisty road and still get that Lotus DNA. Amazing steering, beautiful handling. And yes, that soundtrack I keep mentioning. Before we jump in and head off towards the Eurotunnel, I kind of want to talk you through kind of the points that make this the GT410 Sport and not just any old Aurora. So we'll do that quickly, then start it up so you can hear it and hit the road. One of the easiest ways to know you're looking at a GT410 Sport is to look for copious amounts of carbon fibre because it's everywhere on this car. Lots of functional aerodynamics as well on the GT410 Sport, but you can see down here carbon fibre on the front bumper, up here on kind of, well, yeah, the bonnet. Uh, but then check out this roof. It's just one huge slab of carbon fibre, which then kind of flows into the louvered rear deck lid. Yes, that's a, a Lotus term, uh, obviously covering the engine and then feeding into this kind of amazing ducktail spoiler. That is one 
one piece of compact. It's just, it's just stunning. Now, of course, this car does have the letters GT in the name, but it also has the word sport, meaning that it needs to be comfortable, but also amazing once you start pushing on. So the car has got Bilstein dampers, IBAC springs, and big old AP racing brakes, making sure that you are ready and raring to go when you find a twistier road. I think this might be my favorite angle of the car. I don't know why, I just feel like from the back, it's just got this real presence about it, helped by, yes, I'm gonna say it again, that louvered rear deck lid. Uh, let's talk about what's under it though. I kind of talked about it earlier, but it's a supercharged V6 engine putting out, yes, you guessed it, 410 horsepower, meaning this car can do 0 to 60 around four seconds, depending how quick you are at shifting through the gears. Not necessarily as quick as the Exige in the Elise, but that's because it's a GT car and it still has creature comforts, Apple CarPlay, speakers, leather, nice material. So yes, uh, moving down here, we've got the single exit exhaust tailpipe. You can get a, tit a titanium optional exhaust for this thing, but this has got the standard one, uh, more carbon fiber in these kind of exit holes behind the rear, tires there, and then a big old diffuser, giving it that kind of purposeful look. Of course, lots to tell you about on the interior of the GT410 Sport as well, but I'm gonna save that for another video because I've got a lot of time to spend in this car to kind of figure it out, to learn what everything does and talk about the, the positives and the negatives. For now, I just wanna start it up. So, pull this seat forward, a relatively simple procedure. Uh, just turn the immobilizer off, turn the ignition key all the way around. It's gonna beep, but we're gonna go sport and exhaust just to try and get maximum sound out the back and check we're in neutral engine start button. Let's do it. <laughs> That's a hint, people. That's a hint as to what's ahead. Anyway, I need to get cracking because I've spent far too long down here. I need to get back to London so I can pack up my bags, load up this car, and then early tomorrow morning, I'm going to be headed to the Eurotunnel. Good morning then, it is 6.30 the next day and as you can see in the queue for the Eurotunnel, my first time coming to the Eurotunnel this year I think, uh, it's insanely busy and in fact actually Eurotunnel tickets insanely expensive so it kind of feels like a normal summer's day especially considering it's now raining um, but yeah definitely doesn't feel weird because of Covid. Um, really impressed with the luggage space, 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 space in the Avora. More on that soon, but for now I, I need coffee and breakfast and then I'll be a bit more ready to vlog. It's just gone two o'clock here in France, and yes, I am in the middle of nowhere, France, and it's got exceedingly hot. It's about 32 degrees, so I should really be wearing a hat. But it's been a rel relatively easy journey, actually, in the Avora. It kind of reminds me of the 4C. I'm definitely more comfortable in this car than the 4C, but it's low, it's wide, it's red. It's a matter of just cracking on and trying to get down to Monaco. Uh, Fuel-wise, being relatively good in that area as well. I think we're averaging about 27 mpg, which kind of equates to around 300 miles a tank. So we've stopped off a few times. All I can say is that France and the kind of route down to the south of France is insanely busy. I thought the Eurotunnel this morning was busy, but no, there's just people everywhere. French tourists, English tourists, tourists from all over Europe seemingly heading in the same direction. So it's a bit of a sort of trafficy, busy drive. In a second, gonna load back up into the Avora and crack on. Before we leave, I wanted to quickly show you the luggage situation actually, because it is mighty impressive how much we've been able to squeeze in here. So, I don't know if you can see, at the bottom we've got a full check-in size suitcase. Uh, on top of that, if I just move this bag here, that's one of our sort of carry-on cabin luggage wheelie bags. That's a bit of hand luggage, there's my camera rucksack, which is pretty decent size. And then if I just push this here and come round to the boot, open up this very nice carbon fibre piece, there you go, another wheelie bag and I've got a few extra bits on the right hand side. So yeah, just to recap, that is plenty of luggage for two people there, two wheelie bags, a big check-in bag, and then a couple of hand baggages as well. So yeah, impressive how much you can fit into this relatively small car.
Only in Monaco does your hotel car park, which doubles as a public car park, have a Huayra, an Aventador SV, a 918 Spider, a TDF, and God knows what else in it. I mean, I have missed this place. As ridiculous as it is, it feels so good to be back, because yes, I am now back. Myself and the Avora GT410 Sport have arrived here in Monaco. This sort of the, the, the perfect place to kickstart this road trip, this first road trip post lockdown. This car has been surprisingly amazing, much more comfortable, much easier on this what has been a 14 and a half hour journey. It's been a long one today, a lot of traffic. We got caught up in about an hour's delay or something like that just outside of Lyon. I'm rambling now, but yeah, it's just been actually pretty easy considering that. And then those final few tunnel blasts with the sports exhaust open. Oh, I just cannot wait to get this thing up to some mountain passes over the next few days. But anyway, this kick starts, as I say, the adventure ahead. So I hope you're excited. Give this video a thumbs up if you are and make sure you stay subscribed for plenty more adventures, especially with the GT410 to come. Mm -hmm.